Hey guys, my name's Thomas Busby, and for those of you that didn't know, I am lucky enough to be an ambassador for Fujifilm New Zealand. And one of the perks of that is I get to borrow quite a bit of gear. And I currently have in my possession every single wide angle lens Fujifilm make. And I'm considering wide angle from 18 millimeters and lower. And one thing I've really wanted to find out for the longest time is which lens is the absolute best for astronomical Milky Way photography. Actually, another nice perk of all this testing I've been doing is I've also managed to find out not just what is the best lens, but what is the absolute best setting for every single wide angle lens Fujifilm makes. So start with, let's talk about how I work this out. So first factor to consider is pretty simple. It's just your exposure time, your shutter speed, how long you can open up your shutter for without your stars moving too much in the shot to make it look like they're, they're blurry, they're shifting. The wider you go, the longer the exposure time you can have. For example, 16 millimeters, you want to stick around 20 seconds. At eight millimeters, you can go right up to 40 seconds. The wider you go, the longer your shutter speed. Actually, one thing to consider when doing your shutter speeds is there are two options, really whether you have a cable release or you're just using a straight in-camera timer. So the limitation here is the in-camera shutter speed goes up in different increments, say 20, 25, 30, 40. And you can't exactly do like 26 seconds or 23 seconds or 32 seconds. So if you're using an intervalometer or a cable release, you can definitely get the more perfectly exposed shots compared to just doing it in camera. So to start with, actually, if you want to bump an image quality, just buy a cable release so you can do exact perfect exposure times. Though for a lot of this testing, I'll be talking about results for with a cable release and without a cable release. Now next up, there are three specs of a lens to consider for working out how good they are for astronomical photography. That is the aperture area, the aperture diameter, and the angular area of your lens. And now these might be some things you've probably never heard of to do with your lens, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. If you'd like to know more, check out the link in the description below for the website LonelySpec.com. It's where I learned everything about astronomical photography, and it's an awesome source of information. But to sum it all up, your aperture diameter, your aperture area, and your angular area of the lens all combine together to decide how much light your lens can let in from a certain part of space. Essentially, it's how bright and how much information your camera can absorb from a very dark sky. The reason this is important is the brighter you can have your shots, the less ISO you need to have in your shots for a higher quality photo. So if you get every single lens and work out those three factors for each of them, and then times them all together, you will get a score to determine how good your lens is for astronomical photography. And well, as you can see on the screen here, the 16mm 1.4 is the best. But what this test doesn't account for is aberrations. Now you might have heard of chromatic aberrations, and sometimes people will say chromatic aberrations, but there's actually quite a few. I think there's like four or five different types of aberrations. The big ones you don't have to care about are actually chromatic aberrations. Removing color imperfections is very easy to do in editing, but a missed shape, like a blur or a stretchy line from your lens is harder, far, far harder. You pretty much, you're not gonna do it, in editing. So to remove these to the minimum amount and then work out what lens is best at what setting, for astronomical photography, that's a whole different story. So I came up with a test, a very consistent test, for working out lens flaws and aberrations. First of all, I needed a star, a very consistent, unmoving, perfect star every single time. The closest I had was actually the speaker here, and I don't know if you can see, it's got that little LED light on it. And that there was as small of a LED light I could get. Yes, while it looks white to us, it definitely changes color from red, green, and blue in photography, but what I managed to do with that was set it up very close to 10 meters away. The reason 10 meters away is important is that's very close to infinity and how each lens will change its focus to measure these aberrations. I then did quite a few different tests measuring different focus accuracy and different ISO levels just to make sure and see if any of those variable factors will affect the aberrations of the lens. Then for every single lens at every single aperture up to 5.6 and every single zoom range up to like that well, normally up to about 16 millimeter. If it had a zoom range, clearly I didn't have to do it with the prime lenses. I took the exact same shot with this little LED light in as close to the exact same spot of every single lens I could, well, on the same spot as the sensor, to measure those aberrations. So once I'd captured every single shot, the perfect settings on every single lens, and every aperture up to 5.6, I then took each file into Photoshop and measured the, the length, the width of those aberrations and compared it to the height of each photo. Now the height doesn't change because I'm using it on the exact same sensor, which is the X-T4 for those wondering. 
and you can work out a percentage of how big those aberrations are. Because it doesn't matter what type of aberrations they are, but the bigger they are, the worse. As a general guide, anything over 1% is pretty bad as far as aberrations go. Under 1% to about 4% is pretty good, and anything under 4% is fantastic. However, if your aberrations drop down to zero, that is not a good thing. That means your star has completely disappeared. You definitely want a little bit because you're trying to capture a star, a little fine point. It is still on? Yep. Another thing I had to test for was exposure accuracy. So if I made my shot brighter or darker, did this affect the size of the aberrations too much? So from testing distance, ISO, exposure, and focus accuracy, I managed to find a very consistent amount that was very, very accurate with real world examples. Now speaking of real world examples, once I've done all these tests, I then went out with every single lens on a new moon night and shot the galactic core with the optimal settings for every single one to compare those aberrations, all those exposure tests to my in-studio test to make sure I had accurate results. Man, you can see I'm struggling to explain all this. So if you haven't kept up, that's okay, because here are the answers. So in last place, unfortunately, is the 18 to 135. It is best at 18 millimeters, f3.5, using a 20 second in exposure time at 3200 ISO, and it gets a final score of 138. Now when I'm talking about these final scores, don't dwell too much on the number difference, it's more about the percentage increase as you shift up. Say so five points is bugger all difference, but a higher percentage increase is what we really need to focus on here. In 10th place is the 16 to 80. While this is a fantastic landscape lens, it's not that great for astronomical photography. It is best at 16 millimeters at f4 with an exposure time of 23 seconds, though if you don't have an intervalometer or cable release, then you're only going to want to use 20 seconds at an ISO of 3200. Next up the list with a 13.8% increase in astronomical performance is the 15 to 45. This lens is best at 15 millimeters at f4 or 3.5. It didn't actually make too much of a difference between these two. 24 seconds or 25 seconds if you don't have a cable release and it gets a final score of about 164. If you'd like a 23.28% increase in quality over that, then the 10 to 24 comes in at 8th place. This is actually best at 11 millimeters, not 10. However, this also gets a special mention because as I went to 12.6 millimeters, the aberrations really picked up. So this is a little bit of an iffy lens to use for astronomical photography. However, as a general guide, if you just bump in a little bit off 10 millimeters, that's the spot to go to. If you go too far, you actually get one of the worst performing lenses you can get as those chromatic and not chromatic, sorry, as the aberrations really pick up and get quite large for some reason, which is a bit odd for a lens. Optimal settings for this one, as I said, 11 millimeters f4, 33 seconds or 30 seconds if you don't have a cable release, and that gets a final score of 212. If you'd like a 14.59% bump in quality, then jump up to the 16 to 50 f3.5 to 5.6. Now this is a far, far cheaper lens, and it's awesome to see these little XC lenses doing quite high on the list as far as astro performance goes. The 16 to 50 is best at 18.2 millimeters. So once again, just jump in that little bit to 18 mil, and you'll get a much better improvement in aberration quality. Shoot it at f3.5 stall with a 20 second exposure at ISO 3200. If you'd like a 2.12% jump in quality, then the 16mm f2.8 lens is pretty much just as good. Which is interesting as that lens is quite a bit brighter and quite a bit more expensive, but hardly gets you any improvement in astronomical photography. That lens is best at 16mm, it's a prime lens, duh, you don't get the choice, f2.8 with an ISO of 3200. Its best shutter speed is 23 seconds or 20 seconds if you don't have the cable release, and gets its final score of 253, or 225 if you're not using the cable release. Like I said, cable release can make that nice little improvement in image quality. Jumping up 18.3% goes to the 18 to 55 f2.8 to f4. Now this is another kit lens, it's not an XC lens, it's still an XF lens, but it got a phenomenally great score for astronomical photography. A lot of you probably have this lens or you might have already sold it on. This lens is best at 18mm f2.8 with a 20 second exposure time at 3200 ISO and gets a final score of 310. Jumping up 24.42% in image quality is the 16 to 55 f2.8 lens. For how much more that lens cost, you'd hope it'd be quite a bit better. That lens is once again at best at the 18 millimeters. So as aberrations drop down, just as you zoom in that little bit, so get to 16, just go bump in a little bit to the 18 mil, and you will get the best astronomical photography photo potential out of that lens as you can. So 18.2 millimeters at f2.8 with a 20 second exposure time at 3,200 ISO and it gets a final score of 410. 
However, very, very close to that and only a 5% improvement is the 14mm f2.8. Now this is a very, very sharp lens, so that does factor it into a little bit, but there is such a little bit of difference in improvement if you're wondering about which two of those two, the 16 to 55 or the 14mm f2.8 lens to get, you're not going to get much of an improvement or change between either of those two lenses if you're thinking about making that upgrade. The 14mm is best at 14mm, well done. F2.8 with a 3200 ISO with a 26 second exposure time or 25 if you don't have that cable release. It gets a final score of 432 or 420 without the cable release. But jumping up from that with a 17.8% improvement is the 8 to 16. Now as this lens is so expensive and so wide you'd expect it to be phenomenal and it is a really great lens. It is best at 8mm at f2.8 with a 45 second exposure time which is really long which makes this lens do so well just because it is so wide. However if you don't have a cable release 40 seconds still gets you a great result with a score of 522 or 464 if you don't have the cable release. Now the best lens, the top of the pile you can get, and I'm sure some of you have worked this out by now, is the 16mm f1.4. However, this lens more than any other really suffers from bad aberrations at f1.4. And so its best settings are 16mm at f2, not 1.4. 1.4 the aberrations are actually quite large and you're much better off to step down just that little bit. With a 23 second exposure time or 20 seconds without the cable release at ISO 1600. Getting a massive increase or 31.21% increase over the 8 to 16 is a 759 or 675 if you don't have that cable release. That is easily the best option to get. However, from my personal experience, the 16 isn't quite wide enough for my taste. I definitely like the 10 to 24 or the 8 to 16. So an easy way to get around this is to do a panoramic and stitch them together and that would be the absolute best way to get any form of astronomical photography with a Fujifilm lens. Though, I have to say, after doing all these tests, I found an interesting little hurdle, a little bit of a roadblock. I didn't notice a huge difference in image quality between all of them. Which is surprising, after all of that, to still be happy with the worst lens was an interesting factor for me. But then I worked out, the reason I was so happy with it is to remove as much noise as I wanted from those worst and best lenses, I had to do quite a heavy noise reduction in Lightroom. See, without that, Lightroom at those high noise reductions, where I was getting some splotchy red marks from noise, and I don't mean little ones, I mean bigger ones, and it was really disappointing to see Lightroom handle those files so poorly. And I was getting different results just as I jumped between the develop module to the library module and then to my export. And then if I put it into Photoshop and then saved it, I was getting different results again from all my different saved JPEGs, which is really weird. So it means my next step to really improve that image quality from my astronomical photography is to find a better way to edit. If you'd like to see that video, feel free to hit subscribe. If all this was far too much, feel free to check out my website or my Instagram story while I have a little cheat sheet so you can screenshot or save or download or share whatever you'd like to do so you can have it on your phone so when you're out shooting with whatever lens you have, you have that little guide there to use the optimal best settings for whatever lens you have for your Fujifilm system. If you would like to see more overall information like this, please subscribe. It would mean the world to me and help make me produce more content like this. If you have any questions or comments, let me know down in the comments below. But otherwise, until next time, I'll catch you next time.